You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a chronological true crime podcast. Each week we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. And this week we're going to be talking about Elizabeth Fales and Jason Fairbanks. This is one of those cases that it's, it's a good, eh, well, it, it has an ending. As, as most things do. <laughs> but you'll see that sometimes with these cases, there's, there, there isn't always an ending. And so... Well, there is an ending, but yeah, it, the ending is, and we don't know what we next. We don't know. Weird things just happen. And this is where I mean, the information just, stops. Exactly. So, uh, let, let's get into it. I'm going to go ahead and we'll name off the sources. I know last week I kind of... I named them as I went through, but I didn't name them like all in bulk mm-hmm. at the top. And I just want to make sure we get those in there. Just want people to know I'm not, you know, making it up. I'm making it all up. Um, <laughs> so the, I used Wikipedia, of course. God bless Wikipedia. And if you have some extra money that you don't want to donate to us, go give them money. Do you know how much like free information they give out? Mm. And they don't make any money. Like seriously, go just. Do it. They have it on their page. Anyways, um, so Wikipedia, the New England Historical Society, the Associated Press, and my new favorite website, Mm. Murderpedia. Right up your alley. I was telling Leah the other day, (laughs) because like we talked about it in our intro episode, but I have a, a NSA agent. Brad, <laughs> Brad, um, who like really needs to chill. Like he just, I feel as though Brad is just like at a ten all the time. Like yeah. I feel like Brad was in a fraternity, and he ended up working for the NSA because he knew mm. someone. I wonder if Spalding gave you his your gave him your name. Could have I? You know I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how my information. Well, everybody's information is out there, really. Sure. But you know, but, I mean, some of your searches, I'm sure, raise some red flags. Look. I now have saved to my bookmark bar, <laughs> Murderpedia, of <laughs> course, and then U.S. executions. <laughs> I mean, hey, let's watch this chick. Yeah, they're like, oh, U.S. executions, Murderpedia. Oh, Capital One. That's good. <laughs> and and how many times did you say, "Hey Siri, I need to hide a body"? Like, I wonder how many times I haven't that was yet. Siri, I have Siri turned off, so Siri's not listening into my conversations. Oh. Now, NSA agent Brad might be, but Siri, Siri's not. Siri's not in my business. I don't, I don't know her like that. Um, <laughs> know her like I don't know that. her like that. We're, you don't know I, me. I might be on a first name basis with her. Doesn't mean she is with me. <laughs> Just saying. So, like I said, this case is going to be about Elizabeth Fales and Jason Fairbanks. We are in 1801 this week. So, in 1801, it was February 17th that the U.S. House of Representatives breaks electoral college tie by electing Thomas Jefferson as president over Aaron Burr. Shocking. He thought he had it in the bag. He really did. But then he thought he'd get to be vice president. And if you see Hamilton, thank, thank him, him for, for the endorsement. endorsement. I, to me, Thomas Jefferson is just Avi Dix. Like, that's all it is. It's mean, just, and, I, and I honestly I like him. it. I like it, and I don't hate it. And what I also find super funny about, just another rabbit trail, what I find super funny about Hamilton is how many, like, kids, like my daughter that loves Hamilton, how many do you think we're going to watch this and they're going to get to history class and they're going to be like, that's not him. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this guy with the wig? Who's, Who's this, this white guy? Who's this white guy? <laughs> I thought only King George was white. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> I mean, I just, I think about that sometimes. Like, how many little kids are out there that are like, that's, that's the guy. That's not the guy. You mean Alexander Hamilton? Oh. Isn't Hispanic? Another, another little rabbit trail that I thought was hilarious. One of my friends, um, they went through Laurel, Mississippi, which is where Uh my hometown or hometown Mm -hmm. is um, 
Yeah, filmed. where they film. Yes, and and uh, I love them. Aaron and what's what's his ben. name? Ben. Yes, they I are love their so show. great. They're, they're yes. my favorite. They don't tear down every wall and paint it white. No, and no. I love that. Yeah, and they're they're great. I love them. But um, so cute. She was. Do you know that they have to make her stand on a box because she's so short. She's so short. I love it. But she if says they're ever cute. if they ever do like an up close with them, she has to stand on top of something because she would be they out. They couldn't of frame. be in the frame. Yeah, that's hilarious. It's the cutest thing ever. So it's. So funny because it's kind of like my sister and her husband. That's true. I, I saw a photo of them together, and it was kind of like far off in the distance, and so you could really see like their height yeah. difference. And then there was another photo of them like recording, and it was an up close, and she was like a foot higher. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's so. I would need it. Okay, so going um, through Laurel. Anyway, sorry. Um, and she has a. I think he just finished kindergarten, but they were going through, mm-hmm. and there, and she told him, "We're going through Laurel." He's like, "Mom, that's not a real place." And she was like, "No, this is the place." He goes, "Wait a minute, you mean hometown is a real place?" Like he thought it was just like a made-up TV yeah, show. We in here, huh? <laughs> and we then here. he was so excited. They I mean they they she showed a picture of Ben's shop, and he was mm-hmm. like, "You mean it's a real place? It's real?" That's so Isn't funny. that sweet? Oh, I love that show. Anytime that my daughter, like, if I'm going to turn something on, I always watch HGTV. Oh, like, because, it's again, it's do. not going to have ugly on it. Well, I just, I like renovations. There's something calming about it. I don't know. Probably just the destruction of everything and then bringing it back together. Well, then you get inspiration about a brand new kitchen and you're so true. excited and about it. And then you get and a dreams. quote on it and it's because everybody is building stuff and lumber is at such a premium. It's twice the price that you anticipated. I'm not bitter. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. This might be a very current situation. <laughs> it's still fresh. I get to go to Disney, though, so. So that's always positive. I mean. Um, so it was March 3rd that the first U.S. Jewish governor, David Emanuel, takes office in Georgia, which I find really surprising yeah. for the South at that time. There aren't a lot um, of Jewish people in the South. No, not really at all. I mean, I think there's like pot, which I'm not being anti-Semitic or anything. No, Just no, saying not there's a like, problem. A, a, there's certain areas like where we live, we just don't ha- we don't have yeah. a lot of temples in general. No, like and there's so, there's yeah. one big one close mm-hmm. to us, and I will say, um, a headmaster that I, I used to teach at a private school. We had a headmaster. Um, his last name was Zeslovsky. I love that. I know, but we called him Mister Z because that's of kind of a mouthful. But um, he was Jewish, but he grew up in New York, mm-hmm. and he was a transplant. Hmm. So not very common in the yeah, South. not in the South. And especially in 1801. That's, I just found that really interesting. Yeah, that is. So November 10th, Kentucky outlaws dueling. But, but not mean, New Jersey. Everything, everything is, is legal, legal in, in New, New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> November 16th, the first edition of the New York Evening Post we is know printed. Who found it we know who did that too. So... Dedham, Massachusetts is southwest of Boston, and it became incorporated in 1636. And I, I'm, I got to put it in here. Look. Dedham is not how you spell Dedham. <laughs> how is it spelled? D-E-D-H-A-M. That makes sense. But does it? Yes. I just, I, I have a problem. With names of places that aren't spelled how they sound. It could be Dedham. Yeah, but I mean, like, it, it makes it maybe like it's the Scottish in me because there's Edinburgh. Yeah, that's true. I, it's just, anyway, some names are just crazy. And so anyways, this is Dedham, Massachusetts, southwest of good old Boston. And uh, again, it became incorporated in 1636. The t- <laughs> The townspeople originally wanted to name the town Contentment. Contentment. That's very sweet. And like, I live in contentment. I don't live in contentment <laughs> in my per in my life. I live in Mayberry. You do. You do. But you know, like, <laughs> look. If I live in contentment, it's because it's a physical place. I just <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they were overruled very quickly. And uh, they were overruled by the Massachusetts General Court. I wonder why they were overruled, though. I mean, I think that's that's Because who wants to name a town contentment? Look, we got some crazy. We got a slap out Alabama. We got slap out Alabama. We got a lot. We though. got up. 
We get op, we have op, 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 uh, East Aboga. And I always went over where West Aboga was. East Aboga. And in Enchanted, she's from Andalu- Andalasia, and there's an Andalusia, yeah, Andalusia, Alabama. We do. We have Andalusia. Yeah, I mean, just, it's, anyways, crazy names. Um, so they were overruled. And contentment is the town's motto now. I mean, that's a compromise. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's one. <laughs> so the Fairbanks house in Dedham is the oldest surviving timber framed house in the United States, and it's that's been impressive. yeah, it's been scientifically dated back to 1637. So one year after Dedham became an actual town, that's a long time. It's ago. a long time ago, and it's still standing. Um, New Year's Day of 1654, a vote was unanimous to establish the first taxpayer-funded public school. So I guess we have them to thank for public funding of our school system. Well, paying teachers, I mean, that's really pretty cool. I mean, I mean it, it was is. just like towns that had to pull together or something, you know? I know. So they did end up... Or private up, schools. They did end up uh, opening a school, and they had a headmaster, and they paid him 20 pounds a year. So about $5,000. Awesome. But it's like... Seventy-one thousand dollars. Seven one. That's a nice chunk. What we should probably pay teachers now. At saying. least. I mean, depending on how long and who exactly. and where. The younger you teach, the more you should get paid. That's all I'm gonna say. I uh, don't know. I got a daughter in, that's just getting out of kindergarten, and I, I God bless them. I taught um, kindergarten, and I loved it. Oof. It's the it's the middle school Mm-mm. teachers that I think need a lot of money because because all those mm-hmm. hormones. <gasps> oh, <laughs> I'm scared of them. I'd rather go straight to high school than have to worry with middle school. So uh, the town has been featured in a number of films and TV shows. The most recognizable that I found um, is the silent Anne of Green Gables in 1919. And who knew there was such? How far back was Anne of Green Gables written? Like, I didn't realize it was that old. I don't know. Um, The Perfect Storm in 2000. My husband's a fan of that show. Not me. Or movie, whatever. And Parts of Shutter Island. Which I will not watch. Which came out in 2010. We're going to go, we just, we're going to go, go with us on this journey for a moment. <laughs> picture Leonardo, it. Leonardo, yeah. <laughs> picture it. Sicily. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I mean, you got Leonardo DiCaprio, first of all. Uh, the nation's gem, arguably. I love uh, Leonardo's my cat. favorite. There was enough room on the door. We all know it. We've seen the markup. I think their body mass would have made it sink she and they would have said, frozen. She said, I will never let go. And she let go. Well, she had to. No, she, did. she, she didn't, didn't let go with her heart, though. She says that. I don't believe that. She carried him with her everywhere. You're going you to let a man draw you and then, oh, look at that. Body sinks that fast in water. Mm-mm. I'm sure he probably didn't sink. I'm sure not either, but. I mean, if we're being factual and realistic <laughs> about it. Guy. Can you imagine being the guy on the Titanic? He's like, is there anyone alive out there? Oh, that's sad. Is there anyone alive out there? Which that's then, really sad. Which then reminds me of, bring out the dead. <laughs> not quite dead I'm not yet. not quite dead yet. <laughs> I think I'll go for a walk. I'll go for a walk. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so. She turned me into a mint. It's so funny. But if you, in all seriousness, if you have not seen Shutter Island, it's on Netflix. I have it as saved to my list. It is such a good, it's like a thriller, like a like psychological yeah, thriller. Yeah, kind of like a psychological thriller. But it's it's so good. And it's a movie that when you watch it, you get to the end and you see the ending and you're really like, oh, okay, cool. Um. How do we get here? Got to watch that again. What? I mean, it's just such a good twist because you never expect it. And guys, Mark, Mark Ruffalo. I do love That's him. That's really all I need to say. He's manly. He, and they have like Boston accents mm. and it's kind of like set in this time of like the 50s and 60s. People and dress. Oh, it was, it's That is like my so favorite cool. time period, by the way, like the 50s, just like, you know, more recent time periods. Yeah. 
I think I would fit in very well in the 50s I because could see that. I love that like, people dressed for everything. I would, like, you a, know, I would have been a flower child. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I love the, you Not know, at Woodstock. I wouldn't have been there. No, too many people. Um, but I love mm-hmm. like, you know, you wear your hat and the gloves and, you know, you wore that. your nice dress and everything. Ugh. I can totally see that. That's all me. But again, not sponsored by Shutter Island by any means. But, you know, hey, if they want to, they, they want to. Somebody wants to throw money this way. Look, we cool. Hey, I'll sponsor. Look, I'll sponsor anybody. Um, so it was May 18th of 1801 that Jason Fairbanks. Staggered to Elizabeth Betsy Fales' home and announced that Betsy Fales was dead. Jason was covered in blood, injured, and holding a knife. Oh, my. So did he, like, proclaim this proudly or just like, hey, guys? he He just, like, showed up, like, staggered up. Which, first of all, if anybody is staggering up to me covered in blood. Yeah, yeah. But but you covered in blood. Something (laughs) Something went down. Something happened. That's not a sight you see every day. Yeah, no. And I'm not going to just believe, oh, this this is normal. Okay. (laughs) Um, Never go with blood. (laughs) It's crazy. So, uh. Nehemiah Fails and Sally Whitting had five children. Too much? I think so. <laughs> um, Sarah, Susanna, Elizabeth, Timothy, and Nehemiah. Because, of course, in that time, all men needed to name a son after themselves. Because why not? Um, Elizabeth Betsy Fails was the middle child, and she was described the same way. Every time, every, every source, every article that I could find about Betsy, they all described her in like just this glowing way. And actually, it reminded me of you. Me? Yes. She must be delightful. She, she must be. <laughs> so uh, everyone said she was vivacious. Yep. She was engaging. That's she was modest. Yep. And she was unassuming. With curly, shoulder-length auburn hair. That's all me. And alabaster skin. That so this could have me. been Leah. Or Merida. This could be Leah. And th- this is... This I could, could be, be a descendant. You. It could be you. It could... Be, yeah, that's true. No, you can't. I don't know. It could be on your dad's side. Who knows? You never know. You never know. Um... So, unfortunately, this is all the information that I could find about Betsy kind of before her death. Any real information about her. She sounds like some kind of chick I'd like to know. You know, and unfortunately, like we've said before in this time, there's just not a lot of information. Which is frustrating. Like, I want to know it's more. Very, I, I do want to know a lot more. I do. Um, so then Ebenezer Fairbanks and Prudence Farrington had. Prudence. S- yeah, Prudence. Had six children. Abner, which again, too many. Yes. <laughs> um, Abner, Ebenezer Jr., of course, Joshua, Jason, William, and Prudence. Oh. So you're going to name two kids. After, literally, good for you. This is 1801. Girl. You burst all those kids. You name one after you. <laughs> I mean, they did use a lot of family names. Like when we look at the Hamilton yeah. family, you know, they, they had do have similar ones. Yeah, I mm-hmm. mean, they use a lot of the same family names over because that was a big deal to honor. Yeah, that's just it's so funny to me. Like it's like Gilmore Girls where there's Lorelai and Lorelai, but Lorelai's Rory. Yeah, the and second one. It's crazy. It's it's just so funny to me. Um, so yeah. Jason Fairbanks, who is the other character, I guess, of our story, and he is a character. Um, he was the youngest in the family. And if you know anything about birth order psychology. Which I do. Again, I was a teacher. Then keep in mind that Jason is the youngest. It comes back. And if you're not super familiar with bo- like the and birth this is order psychology. stereotypically, it's not like set in stone. Yeah, it's not every time. But most of the time. Exactly. Most Typically, likely. your yeah. oldest child, if there's, you know, more than one child in the family and you're not blessed to be a only child like myself, <laughs> um, 
you know, the oldest is typically the overachiever. They're the one that makes the good grades. They're kind of like the mothering figure of the siblings. And always taking trailblazer. Yeah, taking care of all the younger ones. Like, they're the first ones to do it all. So Uh kind of like the parents, that's like, we're going to try our best. Like... (laughs) They so, they do all the first. Yeah. Then you have your middle child, which typically... And I'm a middle child. Yes. Middle children typically strive to overachieve. Like, that's kind of, it's kind of ingrained because they want to be more noticed. They want to stand out from their siblings. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of people jokingly will say that they're, like, they're the middle child. Like, they're the forgotten one and everything. And I don't think that's the case. I just... Um, Sometimes it's hard to, um, like, I came after, mm-hmm. I, I'm an intelligent person. I don't math. I don't math. You don't count with letters, so they should not be in math. That mm-hmm. is that is my personal mm-hmm. philosophy. My sister, who had the same teachers as I did in we high dis- school we and middle school. We discussed Jody at length in our intro. If yeah, you do yeah, not yeah, know yeah. about her, you may go back. Hello, Jody. Very, 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 I mean, she's very intelligent. And she, she maths. Like, she got it. She, I could see that. She and one particular math teacher, um, they got along really well. She was his teacher's aide, and and he would bark at her, and she'd bark right back. Like, you know, they went back mm-hmm. and forth. And then I had him in Algebra 2. Like, she's doing trig and physics and all that. Algebra 2. And finally, somewhere in the year, he says, call him by my last name. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you're not much like your sister, are you? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or not. Well, but, but thank you. I, well, I, in that class, believe it or not, I tried my best to be invisible because I really wasn't yeah. comfortable. And so I well, wasn't mouthy. Right. And then, too, when you when you are the second child, you there's do. There's an expectation. There is because there's been an expectation built up. And so, you know. I can be hard for middle children. And, yeah. and, and but I get, we also are peacemakers, That's too. true. Y'all do like to keep the peace. Then we get to the younger siblings. Yeah. They're, like I have one said, of those, too. There's an exception to all this. Well, to be a middle, <laughs> you have to have a younger ma'am. So, this is, you know, there are exceptions to every rule. Mm-hmm. Typically, the younger child is the child that gets away with everything. Yeah. And I will say, it, gender does play a role into it, it as does. well, because mm-hmm. it was my sister, then myself, and then eight years after me was a brother. And so gender mm-hmm. is different. And he had three mamas. Mm-hmm. And I will say that his wife has thanked my sister and myself more than once for <laughs> exposing him to female crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> from a young age, mm-hmm. because he understands that sometimes we just want you to say, let me give you a hug. Or, mm-hmm. hey, that stinks. Well, and your brother is very smart, too. He's he is. Very, he's, he's in the Navy. He is. And um, he's in the Sonar program. Yeah. So he's very intelligent. So what happened to you? That's what, unkind. It's like, you're the, it's like you're the ice cream in the sandwich. I'm the sweet part. But I expected there to be cookies and cream in that ice cream, and it's not. Hey, guess what? I get to work from home, so I think I did pretty (laughs) daggum well. They the chumps that got to wear a uniform or a suit. I get to. I mean, that's true. So you know, like like we said, there is there is some some interesting things with birth order psychology. There's a lot that's out there. There's a lot of truth to it. Yeah, there, I think there is a lot of truth to it. And then, you know, there's also things to be said about when you marry Mm. someone else, depending on what birth order they're in or not in. Usually two oldest can't get married. Like it's just a clash. It's like clash Mm -hmm. the Titans. Like you're always like arguing with each other, you know, you want to be the dominant stereotypically. Again, we're Mm -hmm. not talking about everyone, you know, I think two middle children can marry. My husband's a middle child as Um, well. The two youngest can't like, yeah, because they're too selfish. An oldest and a youngest can a middle and a youngest can. And middle and middle. Middle can marry middle anybody. Middle. They're used. Yeah. Middle, middle will just make things work. They're, they're like they're, typo blood. Which my husband is as well. Of course. But yeah, like you're the, you're a middle. I'm a middle and he's a middle. Mm-hmm. And it works. Like my, and I mean, come to think of it, 
I'm an only. Mm -hmm. And typically with onlys, onlys can't marry the oldest. Mm -hmm. They'll clash. We can marry another only because they kind of get our weird idiosyncrasies. Right. And we can marry the a youngest because we're used to taking care of other people. Yeah. And one in a middle too, mm-hmm. because you would just mm-hmm. Yeah, middle middle's fine, but it's just really the oldest. Um and like come Problem. to think of it, my boyfriend is a he's a middle. Mm-hmm. So that would make sense. I'm an only and he's a middle. Um but he's older than me. Mm-hmm. So like by a few years. And so to it's kind of funny because it's like while it doesn't seem like it. I don't know. For some reason, I still feel like he he's the oldest. And then I remember, oh, he has an older sister <laughs> um, who, like, guys, if his older sister, she's a trip. Um, I've heard too many stories, and she's funny. Me and her, we're on the same level. Um, so, yeah, again, if you know anything about that birth order, you know, now you do. If you didn't, if you don't know, now you know. Um, if you don't know, <laughs> now you know. So, just pay close attention to that when it comes to Jason's actions um, in this case. And I think that it'll be very telling, you know, kind of as we go. Jason came from a prominent Puritan family in Dedham, and they lived in the historical Fairbanks house that I mentioned earlier. That's like this is 1801. Years now. Yeah, it's like 170 years old by this point. Ridiculous. Yeah. So. When Jason was 12, he got the smallpox vaccine and ended up getting smallpox anyway. He was treated by doctors. Most likely, he was treated with mercury, which actually stunted the growth in... we found out that wasn't quite as good as we thought. It stunted the growth in Jason's right arm and left it kind of paralyzed almost some say frozen some say paralyzed so stunning the growth like was one arm shorter than the other Mm -hmm. yeah the the growth wasn't exactly the same as his left arm so i was really curious about mercury kind of used as medicine because like clearly we don't do that anymore like Mm. we can't even get mercury thermometers like that's not a thing so um i found an article from the associated press and they just kind of put it out there just In a perfect way. So um, the article is titled, Mercury Has Many Forms. Some that cure, some that kill. Pretty cut and dry there. It's like, all right. I mean, I will say. There is a (laughs) down. My dad talked about when he was in chemistry Mm -hmm. um, in the same high school that I attended, by the way. Um, We had the same senior English teacher. But when he was in high school, they he talked about playing with mercury. Just crazy. The liquid mercury. Um, so there are three forms of mercury, and this is all from the Associated Press article. This is a quote from them. There are three main forms. Elemental mercury is the silvery liquid used in thermometers and thermostats, and barometers, and batteries, and by experimenting students in chemistry class. Like my dad. It also is used in folk medicine and in some religious practices. What religious practices would require I don't know, mercury? and if you guys know, like, please tell us. I'm really I, curious. I, I, don't, I don't know what that's about. That's, that's, mm, that sounds like one of those churches that's way out. Um <laughs> It vaporizes quickly when it's heated, and it's only toxic in its vaporized form. So then we have inorganic mercury salts that are typically used in antiseptic creams and ointments. One of the most commonly used mercury salts is calomel. It's a white powder employed in electrochemistry. For years, it was used as a teething powder for infants. Until it was discontinued in the 1940s. Once we found out that, hey, this it could good. kill you. So organic mercury compounds such as dimethyl mercury and methyl mercury are sometimes methyl. used as yeah, are sometimes used as fungicides and herbicides and are by far the most dangerous form. Unlike elemental mercury, they are readily able to be absorbed by the body 
and signs of poisoning take an insidiously long time to appear. Hmm. That's um, a fun word, too. Yeah. <laughs> Mercury poisoning, it can be reversed if it's caught quick enough. But unfortunately, with dimethylmercury, once the side effects are noticed, the damage is irreversible. Ooh. Which is likely what happened with Jason Fairbanks. Yeah. So I really, I, and then this article, fun fact, the term Mad Hatter. I know this. This is one of those obscure facts that it I know. Is. It's so weird. So the term Mad Hatter originated in England when mm-hmm. hat factories used mercury to clean and its toxic effects wore off on the employees. So they were called Mad Hatters. Yeah. Because, I mean, crazy. they were immersed in it all the time. Mm-hmm. They had it on their hands. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. they, it was all around them. And so they just absorbed it in their skin. They breathed it in. Mm-hmm. And, and they went bonkers. Oh, which makes me think. And there's some people out there. You're going to be screaming it at me in just a second. But it makes me think there's this case where um, it's these women. And I want to say they worked in a watch factory or something. But they were always touching this certain specific time like type of radiation was it radium there is it the one that there's a new show about it on netflix i don't know they taught but these women like they glue in the dark it's crazy and i know some of you are like screaming what the name of this is at me and there's like glue in the dark or glowed in the dark they glue they're dead now but wouldn't it be still be glowed i don't know they glue Interesting. I don't know. We'll conjugate that. Dictionary. Contact us. I don't know. (laughs) So, according to Ebenezer Jr., Jason's, who, you know, he was Jason's brother. And he'll, he kind of. He's big brother, right? I believe so. All I remember is that Jason's the youngest. So, he'd have to be big brother, obviously. Yeah, But But I don't remember how old he is in in relation to Jason. I would think that the first son would would Mm -hmm. be the one that was named after the I would think so, too, yeah. That's just kind of my thought. So, according to Ebenezer Jr., the effects of the illness never really quite went away. If Jason exerted himself too much while working, he would get headaches, a fever, fatigue, and even, like, he would bleed in his lungs. I've never heard that. So, while the description of Betsy is always glowing and it's consistent and, you know, everyone loved her, Jason seemed to have kind of a Jekyll Hyde complex to him. Mm. Um, Jason didn't excel in academics. And his parents recommended that he tried to pick up a trade instead of education, which reminds me of when Marsha, my mother, <laughs> I know, mm-hmm, I know you're listening. It's kind of like when I played softball for that little bit of time. Can you imagine? <laughs> no. And my mom is like, honey, maybe we try something else. <laughs> it's like, Jason. You're too stupid to go to school. Or like, Let's try a trade. Which, I wanted which to. Which, do a trade, please. We need trades and, and, and smart people do trades. I, I mean, mean please You have to be do. smart to do them. But Jason was otherwise abled. I guess it's the best way to say it. He, could, he couldn't use his right arm. Yeah. So, I mean, like, he couldn't be a blacksmith. He, he couldn't, couldn't do things do like that. So. things that were labor intensive. Exactly. But he could be like a watchmaker or, you know, a, a jeweler. Maybe, maybe he didn't want to glow in the dark. <laughs> Um, so even though Jason was failing in school, his parents still sent him to an academy that would help prepare him for college. Like a prep school? Yeah, kind of like a prep school. Um, one perception was that Jason was the rich kid who didn't really care that his parents were sending him to an expensive school. And he was, quote, frequently guilty of excess. Guilty of excess. Mm Mm-hmm. And imputed to juvenile indiscretions. But Ebenezer Jr. said his brother pursued education because he knew it was the best way for him to get a job and that he could earn money on his own. Um, Because he was not able to work very well, this would kind of be the only way that he would be able to get a job and be able to make money for himself. Yeah. Um, Either way, he met Betsy Fails. And he fell in love immediately. And then 
it bordered on obsession. (laughs) Over a period of years, Betsy and Jason dated on and off, which this is disputed depending on which side of the family or friends you're talking to. Um, Betsy's friends said that she was in love with Jason, but her family said that they were at best acquaintances and Betsy did not want to marry him. So the love was on his side only? That's kind of what the parents are saying of Betsy. But you said the friends said... The friends said that they were in love. I'm inclined to go with what the friends say because, you know, I, you don't always Yeah, ex- you don't always disclose. tell everything. And we'll get into it later, but, like, the fails did not like Jason. Um, and, like I said, we'll get into it, but it, it's just, it's, it's weird. It's a he said, she said, for sure. Mm. Um, on May 17th, 1801, Jason's niece, it's, it's unclear because we don't know how old the niece was. She either playfully or maliciously made a fake marriage certificate for Jason and Betsy. Which I don't know why you would do that. It's the weirdest thing. That is kind of odd. So there's some speculation that the certificate was meant as a kind of trap to convince Betsy that the couple were already somehow married. Which I don't know how you would do that. Did she present it to Betsy or no? The niece yeah. gave it to Jason. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, so on the same day, Jason ran into his friend, Reuben Farrington, and mentioned his proposal, quote unquote, to Betsy. And Jason said that he, quote, planned to meet Betsy in order to have the matter settled. And this is kind of like if you got little kids around this, you know, cover their ears for a minute. He went on to say that he, quote, either intended to violate her chastity. Evans. Or carry her to Rentham to be married, for he had waited long enough. Rude. Excuse me. You can wait the rest of your life if you want to. I mean, you can go Which at the rate you're going, it's not going to be long. I mean. I, I can't. I, I can't. And the fact that this was like, this is what he says. He's like, I love her so much. I'm either going to violate her or I'm a kidnapper. I mean. Or she's going to say yes. But like so weird. That's not. So weird. Doesn't sound like love to me. Sounds like an obsession. Not at all. So according. (laughs) I mean, just. You're going to end the day happily engaged. Or it's going to end in assault. I mean, and you one, have to marry him. One of two things. I mean, because at that time, that's, I mean. It doesn't sound like a good plan. No. So the next morning, it was May 18th, 1801, and Reuben Farrington saw Jason that morning. And he asked Jason for some help in the garden, but Jason said he was too weak that day to help him. Which one of his bad days. Was, yeah, he said he had good and bad days. And, you know, the older he was getting, his health just really kept deteriorating it was kind of you know a slow decline and that wasn't uncommon or was it an alibi mm-hmm. it's the setting the mm-hmm. stage for something uh reuben said that jason was happy and jason said he would tell him in the next couple of hours what the outcome of his conversation with betsy would be betsy was at home that morning helping her mom and sister with the house and the chores and. They both said that Betsy was in a cheerful mood. Uh, a neighbor to the Faleses borrowed a book from Betsy's sister, and Betsy was going to get it back to read it herself. This is my favorite. Betsy then had a glass of milk for lunch and went to the neighbor's house between wait, 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 12 wait. and 1. Was there anything with her milk? She had a glass of milk for lunch. That is not enough. I would be so hangry. See, I don't like milk anyways. So I'm not a big milk it. drinker like either. Milk. I'm not a, not a fan. I never really have Not happened. just straight up milk. No. Mm-mm. 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 I can't stand it. So I put it in cereal. I, yeah, I'm, I just ugh, don't yeah. love it. Yeah, glass of milk. Just like, mm, I'm stuffed. <laughs> I must go, <laughs> well, they did wear corsets that, at that time. I must go on about my day. That can't. is not enough for me. 
I can't. So uh, the book that she was going to get was called The History of Lady Julia Mandeville. Lady. It was a British book about two lovers engaged to be married who both died. Well, that's a tragedy. And very interesting as to what happens next. The neighbor wasn't done with the book yet, and Betsy stayed over for about an hour more. It said she played with some of the kids at the house. She might have read a book, whatever. She hung out for a bit. Okay. And then she walked into a nearby pasture, um, which that was just kind of like her way home. It's unclear whether Betsy was intending to meet with Jason that day or if he was just kind of like creeping around waiting for her to come. Oh, ready to give her an offer she couldn't refuse. I mean, yeah. So around three that afternoon, a couple of Betsy's friends heard Betsy laughing in the woods nearby and then heard screaming. The friends heard of Betsy's death about 15 minutes later. Yikes. Jason staggered to the Fales' home, covered in blood, injured, and with a knife in his hand, exclaiming that Betsy had taken her own life. He continued stating that he was so distraught by what happened that he tried to do the same. This is the guy that had just said, Mm -hmm. he's going to marry her. He's going to have her one way mm -hmm. or another. Yep. Betsy's father and uncle ran to the area Jason directed them to, and they found Betsy. And it's actually said, like, I saw this in a couple of things. It was actually said that she was still alive. What? But not, like, super conscious. Oh. But she was alive. So, yeah. Um, she was on her way out. Yes. I guess uh, that's a nice way to put it. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not really a nice way to say oof. that. So, Jason's story was that he showed Betsy the fake marriage certificate as a joke, but she did not take it the same way. Um, she took a knife and injured herself several times and then ripped up the marriage certificate saying they would never be married. Then Jason took the knife to do the same and he was not successful. I mean, like, was this, is he saying she was so embarrassed by this? We don't know. She just said that, that, I mean, I guess, I don't know. She was just super mad about it. And we don't really know the whole conversation that happened, you know, because it's between them two. Sure. So, you know. Uh, They did find the ripped up marriage certificate uh, near Betsy's body, along with Jason's coat and wallet. Why is your wallet out? I didn't understand you taking off a coat. Like, it's May. Fall out? I mean, it's May. Like, you took a coat off. It's probably out. Why do you got a coat on in May in the first place? Did he have. That's sketchy. Did he have the marriage? Reminds me of those guys. You see the movie Hercules? Like the Disney Hercules? Which one? The animated one. Well, yeah, but what guys? The guy that pops out and he's like, you want to buy a sundial? Oh, yeah. That's all that it reminds me of when they say, like, (laughs) his coat. And it's like, his coat? Why did he have a coat on in May? But, and perhaps, you know, maybe wallet could have been, like, a larger item than what we are thinking. Yeah, And that's what the marriage certificate was in. Yeah, that's true. It's just something odd to be just out. Yeah. Um... The injuries that Jason sustained were too serious for him to be taken directly to jail, so he was taken inside of the Fales' home for medical treatment. So here's where I'm going to quickly describe the injuries which caused Betsy's death and the injuries to Jason. It's not a super long explanation at all. It'll just take, uh, you know, maybe 10 seconds to go through. Um, But it's a low-level, it's probably a low-level trigger warning. So we're going to start in three, two, one. Once Betsy's body was examined, it was reported Betsy's 11 stab wounds looked defensive, which included one wound to her back and one to her throat. Jason had a laceration on his throat and multiple stab wounds. The local newspaper said that Jason was, quote, still alive but in a most deplorable situation. So she And that's, had, by the way, that's the end of the descriptions. She had a wound in her back, back. that she inflicted herself. That's what they're saying. That's what one that's side That's kind of difficult. I know. So Jason was tried in front of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts around three months later in August. Um, it was actually August 8th. 
Um, the prosecution was handled by James Sullivan, who at the time was the Republican Attorney General of Massachusetts, and he actually went on to be governor. Uh, governor. The defense had two prominent Federalist attorneys. I don't know why that's important, but it was in everything. <laughs> so Harrison Gray Otis. Apparently it's important. I know. Harrison Gray Otis and John Lowell Jr., uh, they were his attorneys, and Harrison Gray Otis was, <laughs> they said he was one of the famous young Federalists. Which, As opposed to the famous old Federalists. <laughs> it just meant that he was younger, <laughs> and he was a younger generation of the Federalists who just followed in the footsteps of Jeffersonian Republicans at the okay. time. So witnesses talked about how Jason uh, had threatened Betsy and her mother on different occasions. Um and how they never met at Betsy's house because it was known that the Fails didn't like Jason. So do we know that the threats really were to Betsy and her mom, or was it mainly to her mom? I think it could have been in front of Betsy, but to her mom. That's, I mean, because if they were, mm -hmm. you know, friendly at least. Right. That, I mean, that would make sense that it was it would. said mm -hmm. to her mom. Like, I can't believe it. But, you know, and we still don't even know what was said. Like, sure. Sure. You know, so I mean, he no may have been him. calling her names in mm -hmm. front of his mama, her mama. Uh, Somebody's mama. Exactly. So the focus of the trial were the wounds on Betsy's body. Uh, the prosecution asserted that Betsy could have never caused the injuries she sustained to herself, especially given that one of them was in her back. Exactly. Yeah. But the defense had a compelling argument that given Jason's physical condition, he couldn't have injured Betsy in those ways since Jason's right arm was completely stiff from the elbow and Jason couldn't even dress himself in the morning without help. So like was his did his elbow bend but everything below that didn't bend? I'm I don't think his it says he was stiff at the elbow. So at his the elbow, elbow not would have from been his stiff. elbow. At, yeah. Because, I mean, there's a mm -hmm. difference. So, you know, and he couldn't even get dressed without help. So how could he possibly do this? Wow. That was the defense. You know, that's their argument. So how did he get his coat off? Uh, who knows? I'm, I'm just saying, if you had to have help getting it off. You could probably get it off, but you could probably need help getting it on. Maybe it was hot and he was just going to throw it over his yeah. arm as he walked away. You know, I don't know. Um. Both sides of the case were flimsy, and so the attorneys just made up stories about what happened, pretty much. Nice. And the defense painted a picture of Betsy and Jason as kind of a Romeo and Juliet star-crossed lovers from oh opposite sides. and The families didn't like each other. Yeah, and there's... Well, there, do we know how his family felt about her and no, her family? there's okay. nothing. Um not that I really saw. I tried to see a few things, but but yeah, there wasn't really a whole lot out, out there. Mm -mm. Um, so this is about to get quote heavy, and it's because I actually have the quotes to be able to find. There is a trial transcript on Levy Weeks, um, but honest, I did not go through it and read it uh, because there's a lot of other information out there on Levy Weeks. On this case, yeah. the trial transcript is kind of it. Um so this will have in this very flowery language, but they did speak very flowery very back did. then. So Harrison Gray Otis, and he's for the defense, said, quote, when their conversation turned upon their future prospects and the small hopes which they entertained of a happy union, Jason produced the certificate and after relating the history of its origin with a desperate and melancholy look correspondent to their feelings, he observed. I fear we shall never be near to the gratification of our fond expectations. I fear that this little fiction is the highest consummation of our bliss, which we shall ever realize. And tearing into pieces the scroll on which their names were united, thus said he, our tenderest hopes are scattered to the winds. Perhaps this little incident, more than all others, contributed to rouse a frenzy and despair, which induced her rashly to terminate by her own hand her existence. Wow. Right? That's like going around the world across the street. Oof. It get, yeah, it's, there's more. 
Oh, there's more. So <laughs> the prosecution turned Jason into a jealous, lustful degenerate who was trying to corrupt Betsy and force her into a marriage she just didn't want. Hmm. Jason's rage grew when he tried to assault her, but when he wasn't able to perform, hmm. this pushed him over the edge. James Sullivan said, quote, Could that have been the laughter? Oh, oh. I didn't think about that. That could be the laughter, which, oh, man. Well, I mean, that Can would, you imagine? That would drive somebody over the edge pretty quick, like, I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, just like, there's laughter, and then, oh, oh. And then there were screams. Well, and he does, like, he doesn't have use of his right arm, so having another part of his body let him Fail down. Him. Yeah, that that's, that's could, emasculating. Could, could call, yeah, that could cause a rage. Um, and especially if you get laughed at by yeah. the object of your obsession. It sounds like obsession to me. That's what it sounds like to me, too. Um, like, it sounds like she's trying to play it cool and like, yeah, we can hang out, but whoa, whoa. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, and when we get to Jason's story, it's even more like, what happened? Like, mm. this doesn't make sense. So, uh, let's see. James Sullivan, who was for the prosecution, said... I now call again your imaginations to an image from whence the eyes turn with horror and of which language refuses a description. When he had produced the false certificate and she had with virtuous indignation tore the imposition in pieces, he became enraged. Perhaps the knife was first exhibited to obtain by terror What he Mm. feared he could not obtain by force. She turned on her face. The stab on her back altered her position. Her shoes and shawl were thrown off in the struggle. When her arms defended her throat, the wound were given in her bosom to remove the obstruction. And her arms and hands mangled to gain access to the neck. Thus far led on, he found no retreat but gave the ghastly wound which more immediately produced her death. But I quit the horrid and distressing scene. I don't know. Yikes. That's a lot. Um, Mangled mm-hmm. hands. I mean, that's, that's bad. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't sound like something that somebody would do to themselves. No, I mean, if you're trying to, to hurt yourself, Mm-mm. then you'd be kind of more direct, doesn't sound I would like think. It. Right. I mean, I haven't tried to hurt myself. No, but... But I, I would assume. Yeah. Um, Jason took the stand, mm-hmm. which I'm kind of surprised. Yeah. Um, sometimes... They normally kind yeah, of advise against wanna, that. Yeah. Um, so he took the stand, and he had his own statement. And it's a bit of a long one, but very interesting. Jason said, And now with all sorrow and blame to myself... Do I pursue the remainder of this melancholy history? For I replied angrily and roughly that if she were capable and willing to believe all that her sisters said upon the subject, she might go to the devil with them. Ooh. Since she so well knew that I had already possessed her person and oh. received the pledge of her most tender attachment. She then, with great quickness, demanded of me if I have ever told anyone of our connection. I rashly but sincerely answered that I had indeed entrusted our secret to my intimate friends, Reuben Farrington and Isaac Whitting. Upon which she violently exclaimed, Oh, you are a monster. And looking on me as I sat whittling a small piece of wood with a pen knife, she cried out, give me that knife. I will put an end to my existence, you false hearted man, for I'd rather die than live. At the same time, stretching out her hand, she took the knife and began as if in a state of distraction to stab her breast and body, screaming out and walking violently from me. While I struck with astonishment, remained without power and in a cold state of insensibility, but was too, 
too soon awakened from this dreadful stupefaction by her coming and either falling or sitting down by me. Her throat was cut, which seeing I immediately seized that cruel knife which had robbed me of all my fond heart held dear. And yet, while it remained wet with her blood, stabbed myself in many and repeated places, only leaving off when I had finished cutting my own throat and when I believed all was over for me. Question. Mm -hmm. So he explains that he had the knife because he was whittling. Do we know if this piece of wood he was whittling was recovered? They didn't say anything about him doing. They just, I never saw anything that said anything about what he was whittling, what was like in his hands. I didn't see anything about that. Um, Just curious. Yeah. I find it interesting though, that you choose when you're on trial for a woman's murder to say that the reason you got into an argument with her was essentially because you talked about how she was because given. you talked about uh, how you took her quote chastity chastity so essentially like sorry if you got kids around but essentially you told people we had sex yeah how dare you like she's a fallen woman like which she especially yeah. at that time was you were ruined and it's just which is so crazy but you know it's just to say that that was the whole reason they had an argument it seems a little self-serving of yeah. like oh well i couldn't have not performed that couldn't have been the reason mm. it's just it's crazy so and maybe he's blending truth and fiction together. I mean, surely she very well could have called him a monster. Possibility. But, you know. Jason Fairbanks was found guilty of the murder of Elizabeth Betsy Fales and sentenced to death by hanging. Jason was taken after the trial to Dedham Jail to wait for his execution, but he didn't go to the gallows without a fight. Ma. Um, Ebenezer Jr., along with some other friends and relatives, went to Dedham Jail and overpowered the jailer to break Jason out. Oh. Immediately, a $1,000 bounty was set for Jason's return, which $1,000 then is like $21,000 now. Oh. Yeah. Um, the plan was to get to Upper New York and then cross over into Canada. But Jason got hungry. I mean, mean, like, it's hard out there. You got to eat. Just south of the U.S.-Canada border, Jason stopped to get some breakfast. I mean, that's the way I travel. I I stop I mean, I understand. I I do, too. When Moses Holt, a guy from Hadley, Massachusetts, who was hunting for Jason, Hmm. spotted Jason and hauled him back with the help of three other men. Just to make sure Jason didn't escape again, he was put in a more secure jail in Boston until okay. he was executed. Question. If he was such a, you know, disabled, um, weak, mm-hmm. whatever guy, mm-hmm. why did it take four men to bring him back? That's a good question. But, um, and I didn't really put it in here because it's a little bit confusing, but he did have like a cousin that was with him. Okay, so it wasn't just him. Yeah, and it and I didn't put it in because it is a little confusing because it was just another name to throw sure, in. Sure. It was only just two seconds. But he did, one of the relatives that helped get him out of jail was going Went with, with him. him. He was Canada. on the lamb with him. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So that, well, could that would be make more reason. sense with there being more yeah. people. Because, I mean, if he, mm-hmm. you know. Because I'm sure the other guy was going to jail. Yeah. Because, because he broke he was, somebody out. Yeah. You know. So, uh, September 10th of 1801, Jason Fairbanks, his, his sentence was carried out, and it was carried out in Dedham. Dedham. Roughly 10,000 people. I'm sorry. Roughly 10,000 people came to witness it, which was around That's five. That's a lot of people. It was five times more than the population of the town. Wow. Mm-hmm. Which, think about this. It's so crazy. People say true crime is just not, oh, this is so new. Why are so many people upset? 
ten thousand people. But also, people I mean, didn't, didn't have, have else to do. Yeah, I they didn't have it. movies. They didn't have radio. You know, that was kind of entertainment, and that was right. one way to have conversation. You know, I was there. I saw it because you didn't have a true, news crew. True. So I'm just saying. I mean, I don't think I so would have been say, one of those people. Let's say you're walking out your house. <laughs> Okay, you look over, your neighbor's walking out too. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he's like, oh, hello, good fellow. Are you going to the hanging today? I mean, Shall we meet at the gallows later? <laughs> I, I, will, I will save your family a spot on the lawn. Like, <laughs> like is this what happened? Well, but you know, that what I have heard that. This is an event. Are yeah. there like carts out there? Somebody selling t-shirts? Stop. I don't think they it's did that ridiculous. yet. Well, they did at Ted Bunny's, but that's a whole other story. Oh, my. Um, but, like, I know the Battle of Gettysburg, like, they thought it was just going to be just a, a one, mm-hmm. you know, one battle. And, like, mm-hmm. people picnicked to see this historic event. Which, let's picnic and gunfire. I mean, it sounds great. But, I mean, it's just, so, it's just so crazy to me that it's five times the population of the town. Yeah, 10, like, this is a big deal. People. So how many executions it? were there? I'm I'm curious. I'm just I curious to see. Maybe that's why, because it wasn't a very common thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I can tell you that then than now. Yeah, I can tell you based off of what I saw. Because full disclosure, I have a website called Death Executions of the U.S. Um, and in that year, I didn't see another one on his date. Okay. So some it wasn't another one that day. There were others that year, but they weren't in the same area. Okay. So maybe that's why. It maybe was they just were like this such doesn't an unusual happen, thing. So yeah. Let's I go. can say I saw it. I mean I would have stayed at the house. I'd have said I will watch your cat probably, and your dog. I probably would have gone. You would have gone. Um, I would have watched your animals that's for true. you. That's true. The five thousand that I have around me right now. So <laughs> if y'all hear like little toes tapping on the floor or meows or Whatever, it's, I have a zoo. Um, Jason was buried in the Old Village Cemetery. And it's the same cemetery that Betsy is in. I think if I were Betsy's parents, I'd be like, you need to find somewhere else to bury your murdering son. But if it's the only cemetery. Make a new one. In the area. Your family has a historic You go and bury him in the backyard. I was, uh, hey. Your family has a historic house. I'm sure it had plenty of land with it. I mean, out in the old country town that my family comes from, out on the old land, there is a cemetery out there. I'm just saying. Would you like to tell the people why um, your husband did not think it a good idea to bury a lost, loved pet in the backyard? Oh, because well, someone was out there. And why did he not? Oh, sweet husband. God bless Michael. But that is the funny because, I mean, honestly, though, guys, I know this sounds weird. And but the someone is, is a dog. It's not like a someone. It is a dog. And they had a previous dog. His name was Barney. It was Barney. And Bernard Axe, P5, actually. Yes. And Axel is our is the most recent dearly departed. Yes, and he's he's an English mastiff. He's big, big dog. He was about one hundred and thirty pounds, so, which is really small for a mastiff, that's actually. True. So, why did Michael say he didn't think it'd be a great idea to bury Axel in the backyard? Actually, it wasn't a great idea to bury Axel just outside the fence of the backyard Mm -hmm. because that is where Barney is laid to rest and he's not exactly (laughs) sure where where he does like he knows basically but he's not sure like how far up or whatever and he does not want to exhume look that is the desecration of a grave exactly we should have put some so funny. endangered plants on top of it or should something. Have. Oh, I've got goodness. a cat over there too. Oh god. But not in the same place. <laughs> it's so funny. This is a cat I ran over. 
Oh, goodness. So two days after uh, Jason's execution, the report of the trial of Jason Fairbanks uh, was published, and that was the transcript of the trial. after he died. Two days. So I wonder... Body's not even cold. I wonder if they executed him early because of his escape but they're like we ain't taking any chances but they executed him string him up yeah i mean the the murder was in may the trial was in august and his execution was september they did not waste time i mean like we're not giving you a chance to run away again let's string him up you know so i wonder Mm -hmm. if that was i mean i definitely could that is pretty quick i I mean that's, that's swift it's quick um You know, and that was how I got a lot of the quotes for this. Like I said before, this is kind of that's kind of one of the only pieces of really hard evidence of of this trial. Mm -hmm. Um, Ebenezer Jr., if you'll remember, the loving older brother of Jason, wrote a book called The Solemn Declaration of the Late Unfortunate Jason Fairbanks. And he spent the rest of his life in a considerable amount of money to try and prove his brother's innocence. That's a lot. But he was not, he, he was not successful. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, here's the deal. Yeah. I have a younger brother and I love my younger brother. And I, my younger brother is not the typical younger child mm-hmm. just because there's so much. He's almost like an only child. I mean, really, because, yeah. you there's know. such a big gap. Exactly. I mean, he was in elementary school when my sister got married, and he was in middle school when I got married. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 it makes a difference, and he was not quite as self-absorbed, mm-hmm. you know. He was mothered, right. but. Um, not the quintessential younger child. Yeah. I mean, and. Let me tell you, I'm on my brother's side, and I will defend him, but mm-hmm. he doesn't have that kind of um, interesting personality. He has an interesting personality, but not in, in a mm-hmm. negative way. Right, right. Um, Which, exactly. I wonder know. if he was given to fits of anger. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if he was this younger child, and he was like the quintessential younger Did child, he, yeah. and was he coddled more because he had that he disability, I think and so. so he, you know, was a petulant child. He was able to just stamp mm-hmm. his feet and get what he wanted. And maybe that's why he did this to her, because he was like, if I can't have you, can't nobody have you. And I know that's from, not good grammar, but, you know. You know, came from a rich family. So he already was ahead of most people anyway. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And if you're the youngest and you have a disability, I mean, you know he was coddled. But the parents of Betsy say it was they were not going to get married or, you know, or there's some speculation that Betsy's family didn't like him. Yeah. So maybe they had seen his fits of anger, if if there were any. I, mean, I don't know that there have been any indi- indications true. that there were. I wonder, though, if it's not so much a case of they knew his health was deteriorating mm-hmm. and maybe he couldn't provide, which he did have a rich family, or or they knew that he might not live much longer. They might not be able to give them grandchildren. Or Ooh. less sinister. They're trying to protect Betsy sure. from losing a husband and at the I age of that. 19. Yeah. Ooh, that's wrong. She was young. Well, but also at that time, I mean, they had a, a large house, and it was not uncommon for, mm-hmm. you know, more of the family to live together in the large family house right. either. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, maybe that was the plan, and so we yeah. can coast on mom and daddy's or big brother or whoever. Mm-hmm. Because I haven't heard much about his parents in the trial. Nothing's so really they said a whole lot. Still? I mean, they um, they defended him just like Ebenezer. So they were still Jr. alive. Did. Yeah, they were still alive at this point. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly from the research that I did, Jason was not the only son they lost that year. Oh. Yeah. I, I think it was Abner. That died in 1801 as well. Before or after? Before. Uh, so they were already. Yeah. In so they already reading. had. They already had one child that they lost. They could be trying to hold on to anything they can of sure. this one. You know, which. I, you know, I hate. But if 
you did the crime. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, and and we're not here to speculate and say somebody for sure did something when they didn't. But signs point to he did this. Yeah, and we'll talk about Occam's razor in the next episode. Oh, Occam's razor, which is basically <laughs> just the most likely thing to happen is probably what happened. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, Ex- quacks like a duck. Exactly. And, I mean, if you go off of that theory, everything kind of points to Jason. But then he had a disability, so he was he very, you know, was... Ooh, ooh. Did, did he, he have a... Arm? Did he have a mercurial temperament? Oh, God. Oh, come on! Come on! But, I mean, really, did that he? That is true. And it, But I wonder, was he, like, amnidextrous? Was he able to use his mm. left arm very well? Or... Women have like pulled cars off of kids. Like, sure. was it such a rage of passion that he was just able? He to didn't push think he through? just did. Well, and here's my thing: you said there was laughter and then screams, and so you know, and all the <laughs> the real life movies you've seen and such. Well, I mean, and I just, I mean, I did say maybe there was laughter because it was like, there were issues, yeah. like. Hi. And then, got nothing. Yeah. But what what I really think could be, um, you know, maybe they she thought that they were playing around and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, you know, because she she mm-hmm. thought he was joking or something, and maybe he got mad because she laughed at him about that and we're joking mm-hmm. around and then like he hugs her and all of a sudden, hey. Mm-hmm. I think she I think the the wound on her back is best described. I think she was running away. Could be. And um, and her shawl was off, so maybe he tried mm-hmm. to grab her shawl, to grab her shawl or mm-hmm. her jacket or something. And her, they said her shoes were off, so she definitely tried to run at mm-hmm. some point. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go off of Occam's Razor, I mean, it all signs point mm-hmm. to poor little rich boy didn't get what he yeah. wanted, and he threw a fit. Unfortunately, you know, because Betsy's family did say she was happy that day. She mm-hmm. gave no sign. This is not like, which our previous case with Elma, where she had verbally stated she right. wanted to do these things. It's not a case of that. This right. is, she was happy. People, everyone loved her. She was... You know, but on the flip side of that, it is, you know, some people that do make that choice on their own to do, sometimes it takes others by surprise. It does. It does. Because you work so hard Mm -hmm. to hide Mm -hmm. that inner sadness and not make other people sad. I mean, I think of Robin Williams. I mean, Bourdain. I mean, you know, and and Robin Williams said um, the, I think this is not going to be a direct quote. But, you know, the happiest people Mm -hmm. are usually the saddest. Yeah. Because they don't want, and and this was me just, you know, extrapolating from that, you know, you don't want other people to be down Mm -hmm. in the dumps and depressed. And and I, I, you know, have had my own doubts with depression, anxiety, Mm -hmm. and all that fun stuff and the medicines. I may have forgotten to take my happy pill this morning, but it's fine. Just one. So I'll take it in the morning. We'll be good. Um, But. You know, and, and there's something to be said about that. So, I mean, we don't know. You don't always know no, what's in somebody's head. You don't. You know, I just, families were a little different back then. Sure. There wasn't as much. There was a very, there was a closeness that and is there not wasn't, common now. It's, it wasn't as easy to hide something. Yeah, because you weren't, you mm-hmm. know, on your phone in your room or the computer or right. whatever. Like, you were together all the time. You helped with the and housework. you had a journal. You got five. You got four other siblings in this house. Ugh. Somebody's going to be reading it. If I got, got no one. time for that. Yeah, I don't either. But you know, I just think that yes, you you definitely don't know. And I've dealt in my past. I've known people who made that decision for themselves, and it is very shocking. And um, mm-hmm. one of them was someone who kind of did have a history of of mental uh I hate to say mental illness instability. But yeah, just just not um 
Well, I mean, it is and an was illness. Younger. Though. It is an illness, but it's it, it was just there was evidence there to show that that there was some things that were mentally going on. It wasn't, you know, it was a major shock, but you know. I, I just don't know. I feel like that in that time, I feel like they would have known if yeah. she were, if her mood changed or and, something and, like I that. I mean, true. I just don't want to say mm-hmm. there's no way that she no, could no, have no, because no. You not just, at all. You, you don't, don't know. know. No, you you never. Know. I mean, I I've never been suicidal, mm-hmm. but I have. I've been low. I've been real low, and then I, you know, it takes all the energy I have to be quote on. Right. To go, right. you know, like to work or to go. Yeah, to and like, I, yeah, we are talking about this. So sorry if it's like triggering to you. Oh, but, sorry. Yeah. You know, um, but yes, it. I mean, just to continue on that line of conversation. I mean, after I had my daughter, I had postpartum mm. bad, and so, and that does you do deal with suicidal ideations, and it's not always. And if there are any other moms out there who have gone through it, I totally get it. I totally understand. It is miserable and it's it is um which is funny because i met you three months after i had ellie is it really it was wow so you know um so i've only known you i mean i've I've, uh, i have only known you as a mom i just forgot that ellie was that young Yeah, she was very young when i started there so um you know i did have that and you know while we're talking about it, while we're on that platform, I want to just say, like, if you think you need help, go get it. Yes. Go get There's it. There's absolutely no shame. None. It is, it is diagnosable mm-hmm. just like it, any it other is. illness. If you are having heart problems, you mm-hmm. would go to the doctor for that. Yeah, and we talked about if this in our intro. Yes, if you're having mind problems, feeling problems, go, go get that go. checked out. Go. I mean. Talk to anybody. Yeah. Talk to anybody. Just someone does care. Yes. Someone out there does care. We care. We do. We do. We care. And, you know. And we've been there. I mean, between the two of us, I think we've (laughs) experienced. And and I want to go ahead and say, you know, I know we're talking about this. I know it can be a triggering topic uh, for some people, but just know, like I said, I, while Leah hasn't dealt with those, you know, thoughts or those ideations, I mean, I have been there and I do understand and just, just know it's not always, I want to do this. It's not always. Well, sometimes it's a what if. I mean, I have had the what if, but not I want to. It's a, what would happen if I just turned the wheel off this cliff? Yeah. What would happen if, and it's not even so, and if you. Would it wake me up? Is it an, it's, and it's, is it an intrusive thought Mm -hmm. that you did not have previously right and we are not psychologists psychiatrists or anything look i've been to enough therapy sessions i mean maybe i should be i don't know but (laughs) you know it, it isn't always just that plain thought of i'm going to do this it's it's thinking of what your family would be like without you yeah that's that's another part. And you I'm just here to say that it doesn't always have to be it's not black and white. No. And mental health, just like a lot of things, is a spectrum. There's and a no lot. two people are exactly Never. the same. Just because something mm-hmm. works for one person doesn't mean it works for another. And mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you are you are you. You're the only you. Yeah, you're the only you that's there. And you know, so you know, I know this kind of took a dark turn. I mean, but, it kind of did, but I mean, I, I thought but that I it think was it's worth very saying. Important. It, it is, and it's very important, and it is something that we talked about in our intro episode that we are very, you know, big supporters of is, is mental health advocacy. We yeah. both have dealt with it. And we've, normalize it. Normalize talking exactly. about it. Exactly. And we've both dealt with it for years. Yeah. This is not something that that is recent no. for us. I, I mean... You know, I know a lot of y'all don't don't know me very well. You're gonna get to know me, but you know, we, <laughs> <Luckily> in. <laughs> we yeah, we started this podcast, so you know, kind of what comes along with that is inviting y'all into our lives. Right. And you know, I do have a major depressive disorder. I do have panic anxiety. I do have OCD. OCD is not treatable. It's it's treatable. It's not curable. There you go. I'll say it that way. 
That's why she doesn't come to my house because my house is not as pristine and beautiful as her house. <laughs> Mine's just everything has a place and everything is in its place. But yeah, I I thought that I was just a very clean person and that I was just very neat and very just this, you know, until I started seeing a therapist and started talking about what gave me anxiety and then found out I am OCD. <laughs> and I mean, which because I will leave some dirty dishes in my sink. Yeah. Which to the people around me, you know, I'm much, much better than I used to be. But, you know. So to say that, like, there are sometimes, too, that, you know, like, I think that I had a lot of issues before I even knew that I had issues. Sure. And because I have dealt with a lot of like tragic things in my life that a lot of people haven't dealt with. And, um, you know, there are some people out there who who have and they have been on the same page as me. And I God bless you for it. And it's difficult. And but, you know, it's always too like into if you're having a hard time, talk to somebody. Yeah. Or get a friend like me because uh, I will pester the snot out of you until you answer me back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't heard from you. You haven't answered me. I have sent you a funny meme. And you did not even... You did not even emote to it. No, I mean, just just an acknowledgement is all I need. Get you you a Leah. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) that's true. That's true. <laughs> Where are you today on a scale of one to ten? Yeah, I mean, what gotta, number are you? You know, on? and if if things are bad, like you got to be able to have, so, yeah, you know. The, well, you, you did that like, for me too. Yeah. You're like, what number are you on? Like, are we you had good? a tornado that came so close oh, to us. It did. I mean, just a few houses. Just a down. few houses down, and it. I mean, it, and we had no power. And we and I live on a cul de sac. You couldn't get out, and mm-hmm. she was like, "Where are you? Are you Where, good? Like, you have okay? you taken your medicine? <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you know, and and. That's fine. Like you need friends. That you do. do. And, and it was, it was very rough guys. Like you went without a lot of things for a lot of days. I had to go into the office oh, gosh, to work. So, so I had to put on real clothes, but you know, yeah, just even if it and is just the anxiety of storms in general right, of yeah. what could have happened. It was I did very, have anxiety. Yeah, it was very bad. It it, it changed the entire landscape. Like I missed my area. road. I yeah. have lived in the same house for sixteen years and I missed my road the first time Which I drove is out. Crazy. It's well, just it, crazy. It completely changed the landscape. Yeah. And so thankfully, you know, thankfully y'all were okay. It didn't hit your yes. house. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're a town where you live, which over here, there's still piles of uh, it's trash crazy. on the sides of the road because people didn't separate it like they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, right. you, you've got to separate because the, the city's not going to mm-hmm. pick up just everything exactly, that you put yeah. out there. Um, people have been complaining about it. And you're like, well, here's what you need to do. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sorry that happened. But, yes, you do have to pay for something. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. That's a soapbox. I'll get I mean, off of it. In and, and the area that we live in, we are, this is, this has been the time of year that we do get a lot of tornadoes. We do get a lot of bad weather. Yeah. We, you know. And I hate it. Oh, I hate it. It's, and it can be for some people, super, super anxiety. Mm-hmm. You know, it was bad. I mean, it, it, it took houses off their foundation. Picked them up and just set them back down. I mean, just crazy. There's one house of one of our church members. She had just sold it. Her husband Ooh. died several or a few years back, and she had just mm-hmm. sold it. And if you're in the house, like people went to clean out the house, mm-hmm. or she's an older lady, mm-hmm. and um, people went to, you know, because the the roof was gone, mm-hmm. and you couldn't really tell. But my sister went, and I, I watched her son while my sister went and did this, and um. You, she said you would open a cabinet in the kitchen and you'd see sky. Oh. How crazy is that? Well, hello. <laughs> yeah. Open the cabinet to start taking stuff up and there's the sky. A house with a view. This isn't really yeah. what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. When I. But we were afraid, you know, they were afraid there's going to be more rain coming in. And there yeah. was more rain coming in. And yeah, so people, I mean, and I have to say tragedies when when things natural disasters like this happen Mm -hmm. you you really do see that sense of community Mm -hmm. i mean it happened and then like i said i live in mayberry i live in a small town and 
you know, you come out and neighbors like, are you okay? Are you okay? Have mm-hmm. you checked on so-and-so? Are you okay? Are you okay? Mm-hmm. And that's the coolest thing. Yeah. Very much off topic, but, yeah. but sorry. You know, if you, if you need help, get help. Help's yes. always there. Help. And so, trust me, I understand not wanting to get out of the bed at all. Oh gosh. You know, we get it, but uh, you know, somebody cares. Somebody always does. Yeah. So all that to say, that concludes our second case. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around with us, guys. I know yes. we went on a tangent there, we but did. um, yeah, that's our second case. One. It, yeah, it was an important one, and um, yeah. Hope you liked it. I hope y'all enjoyed it. I hope y'all are enjoying these so far. Um, and if you're back this episode, thanks. Come back again. Thanks. We've got more. Next week's going to be great. It's going to be. It's going to be a good one. Next week's episode doesn't have. A trigger level <gasps> guys that's exciting it's, it's a good story it's a good one I um, good story so yeah on that note you can follow us on instagram at one nation under crime and on twitter at o n u c pod if you love our podcast just as much as we do please follow us on your preferred podcast platform whether that be apple spotify google wherever you decide to get that from, you know, and recommend us to your friends, your family, your dentist, your garbage man, a fellow or a woman, patient of dentist or your dentist or doctor. I you mean, could be in line at Target. Yeah. Stranger on the sidewalk. I mean, need to make small talk, you know? Hey, do you like true crime? Need to make friends? You, you like, like history? You like history? Do you like to hear two Southern girls talk? True. That's true. I mean, we can lay it on thick if we yeah. need to. So, yeah, we would appreciate it. We do have a Patreon in case anybody is interested in that. It is still just under One Nation Under Crime. And if you have any questions for us, you can email us at one nation under crime at gmail.com or just input. Or you got family stories we want to hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always love a good family story, maybe family lore. And I, I will forever say, you got a grandfather that went missing and a grandmother who's still here. And you look how you, how always, you, always picking on the ground. How you looked under the basement. Look, just saying, um, you know, always tell us grandma. if there's like some story that goes through your family and it's like the one thing nobody talks about, but it happened, but nobody wants to talk about talk it. Talk about it to us. Talk about it. Uh, we would love to read it. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening to us this week, guys. Mm-hmm. We appreciate you coming back for more and come back next week we will be here at the same time different cry and remember there isn't always liberty and justice for all we will see you next week bye